Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, a keynote presentation, a me mechanistic approach to overcoming antibacterial drug resistance, presented by Dr. Neil Oshroff, a professor of biochemistry, John Coniglio, Chair in Biochemistry at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window and type those questions into the box that appear at the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of our presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing this presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use that Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process for obtaining your credits. One last note, I'd like to let everyone know that this Today's educational webcast will be available for on-demand viewing until December 2017. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Neil Oshroff. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. Hello, my name is Neil Oshroff. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you today about some of the work that my laboratory has been doing at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Uh, today we're going to talk about the mechanistic approach to overcoming antibacterial drug resistance. Specifically, we're going to be talking about quinlone antibacterials. So I want to talk to you about the drugs and how they work and some new drugs that are coming up that can also have the same targets. I want to talk to you about the bacterial targets we're going to be talking about, which are DNA topoisomerases. And I want to talk a little bit about the DNA itself because we need to understand some properties of the DNA to understand how these enzymes work. So. Over here on the left, what you see is actually a eukaryotic cell. We're going to be talking over here about prokaryotic cells. The point still remains the same, that all of your genetic information is embodied in this one-dimensional array of bases, A's, T, G's, and C's. But the way it exists in the cell and the three-dimensional properties of that DNA really go a long way toward controlling how the genetic material is expressed, how it's passed from generation to generation. So this is actually an E. coli where what you can see is that the uh, DNA is actually attached to the membranes and there's a whole lot stuffed in a very small amount of, a very small area so that ultimately some of the most important three-dimensional structures are topological in nature. Now basically as long as the ends of DNA are fixed in space as they are with bacterial uh, DNA because it's circular, um, it turns out that topological um, relationships are those where you have to cut the double helix. Fundamentally, this is DNA we call relaxed. It's got no torsional stress on it. But in fact, in all of our systems from bacteria up to people, DNA is underwound about 6%, and we call that negatively supercoiled. It can also be overwound, and we'll talk about that as well. So that you have this whole range of in information. And why is this important? It's important because underwound DNA can be, um, the double helix can be opened more easily. Remember, DNA, the double helix is actually just the storage form for the genetic information. So to get to that information, we have to be able to pull the two strands of the double helix apart. Hence, if the DNA is underwound, it puts energy in, it's important, it's good, and it helps uh, you be able to access the information. The problem that you get into is if you look here, this would be a replication fork or just anything that pulls the double helix apart. You're not changing the number of times the double helix is turned, the number of turns, you're just compressing them into a smaller and smaller space. So the problem you have is anytime a tracking system goes through DNA, it could be a replication fork, it could be a transcription complex, the, replic the, the machinery, the proteins move straight and the DNA spins. And so ahead of this, what happens is the DNA gets overwhelmed. When the DNA DNA gets overwound, just like this rope over here would be, the problem is machinery can't go any further and things will stop. So you have to be able to alleviate this problem. The other thing that happens is sometimes during replication, uh, 
what happens is that some of this energy that you've got over twisting here goes behind the fork and the two strands, the double helix, the two daughter chromosomes get intertwined, interwound. Hence, um, you get what we call catenines, where they're inter basically interlocked circles. The other thing that happens is during normal cellular processes, uh, you get knots and tangles in your DNA. Just think of it as having a really, really long rope at home. If any of you knit, you can probably relate to this. Um, if you have a lot of rope in a very small amount of place, ultimately you're going to get knots in it. And the exact same thing happens in the cell, and the cell has to be able to deal with this. So here are the reactions we're talking about. We have to be able to take DNA that's underwound or negatively supercoiled, which is its normal state. We have to be able to then take DNA that becomes overwound ahead of things going on in the cell and bring all these back to something that's more relaxed. At the end of replication, daughter chromosomes are interlocked. We call these catenines. You have to be able to pull them apart. And the same thing happens uh, recombination processes. You put knots in your DNA, and you have to be able to deal with that as well. The enzymes in the cell that do this in bacteria and in humans are, are called topoisomerases because they, talk, they alleviate topological stress in DNA. These are ubiquitous enzymes, which means that every cell type has them. Um, they all act by generating transient breaks in the DNA because the only way, if you think about having a rope that's totally tangled, the only way to get the tangles out of it in the cell, you have to break it, pull it apart, and put it back together again. Um, there are two kinds of topo, or two classes of topoisomerases, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 makes single-strand breaks, hence they can deal with over and under winding in DNA. Type 2 topoisomerases make double-stranded breaks. They can deal with under and over winding, but they're the enzymes that can also take knots and tangles out for you. We're not going to worry about the type 1 enzymes today. We're going to focus on the type 2. Now, the thing that becomes really important about these enzymes is when they cut the DNA, you don't want the ends flying off into space, so the enzyme actually forms a covalent bond between active site tyrosine residues and both ends of the DNA that get cut. And this covalent enzyme cleave DNA complex is referred to as a cleavage complex. And this is going to be really critical because this is the actual target for anti-cancer, anti-cancer drugs, but also antibacterials we're talking about today. Now, the way these enzymes work is this is a topoisomerase 2 representation. Down here is actually a structure of a eukaryotic enzyme, but pretty much the bacteria look very, very similar. So what you have here is there's two halves. Um, this is a double helix here and a double helix coming out of the board at you. Um, and what happens is you take one of these double helices, you make a double strand break, you pass the other one through, and then it comes out the bottom of the enzyme. So at the end, the beginning of the reaction, this helix is above this one. At the end, it's below. So the only thing these enzymes do is they change the spatial configuration of DNA. But they're really important and they're really powerful enzymes because basically what they do is they make DNA completely invisible to itself. So you can appreciate how amazing that would be if you had a rope and you just pull it through itself without anything ever happening. Now, in bacteria, there are two kinds of type 2 topoisomerases. There's something called DNA gyrase, and there's another one called topoisomerase 4. Both of these are really important enzymes. Uh, gyrase is an essential enzyme, and this is an interesting enzyme because this enzyme can actually underwind the DNA by itself. So it's the enzyme that puts torsional stress underwinding negative supercoils into DNA. At the same time, it can remove positive supercoils or overwinds that happen ahead of replication forks, transcription complexes. Topoisomerase 4 is the enzyme that takes knots and tangles out of DNA. And it has to do with the way these enzymes work, and I'll show you that in just a sec. Right here is a, is a representation of a replication fork. So what you see is as the machinery is moving through the DNA, you get positive supercoils, which means you overwind the DNA ahead. Some of this energy slips behind, and now you have what we call precatenine. This is where the two daughter chromosomes are tangled. Topoisomerase 4 works by that mechanism I just showed you. Gyrase works by the same mechanism, but what it does is it takes the DNA and it wraps around itself. So it actually creates a positive supercoil that so overwinds the DNA. Then when it passes it through, it becomes a negative supercoil. Bottom line is this. Because of the way this enzyme can grab two different helices, it can take them from any place in the genome. So it's really well suited to take out tangles in the DNA. Gyrase, on the other hand, because it takes, wraps around the double helix, it's in really close proximity, can't take out knots and tangles 
like this, but what it's really good at is putting negative supercoils in and also taking these positive or overwound DNA out. So this is the one that sits ahead of a replication fork usually. There's some evidence that topo isomerase 4 may be able to sit ahead of that fork as well, but it's the one that definitely sits behind it and, and at the end of replication untangles daughter chromosomes. Now, one thing you can appreciate is the fact that these are really important enzymes. We talked about the fact that they are really powerful enzymes. Um, but the problem is, they, in order for the cell to have them, they pay a really dear price because it turns out these are really dangerous enzymes. And this is where we turn to drugs. It turns out that the only way these enzymes can work is if they make double-stranded breaks in DNA. And the real problem is that the most dangerous thing you can possibly do to DNA is put a double-strand break in it. Because if you see over here, if you don't put the ends together correctly, uh, you can lose a big portion of your DNA, you can recombine it in ways you don't want to. So under normal circumstances, these enzymes cut and they put the DNA back together again pretty quickly. And if that happens, you have this nice balance of um, cleavage and back to ligation and everything works well in the cell and, and everything's great. If you take the activity away, what happens in a bacteria is you start getting much slower growth rates if it gyrates because it's sitting ahead of a fork taking out this overwound, this torsional stress that's accumulating in front. And topoisomerase 4, what will happen is you can't segregate daughter chromosomes. So if you start taking away this activity, basically the cells will die of a catastrophic mitotic failure. On the other side of the equations where we're going to play today, what happens if you had, let's say, a drug that made this enzyme cut DNA too much? So what happens is you have drugs that will basically interact with the enzyme, but they'll sit right here where you've cut the DNA. They'll slip in almost oops, like a molecular doorstop. And what they'll do is they'll prevent the DNA from being closed. And what happens is they keep the DNA open then. Um, and so if anything starts moving through it, what you can appreciate the fact is think of this as a railroad track. And if we take the, the two tracks apart, and if nothing comes through, we put them back together and everything's fine. But we pull them apart, train comes through, everything gets ripped up. Now, with the train, we're going to be really concerned about the train, the people on board, freight they're carrying, and things like that. We're, the least thing we're going to talk about is the track. In the case of us, the track is our double, is the DNA. In the case of bacteria, it's their genome. So the fact is, if we break the track, that becomes really important. The train itself are really proteins. We get a lot of proteins in the cell, but we only have one set of tracks. So because of that, um, what happens is if you now have this trapped in this cleavage complex and some replication complex or something else comes through it, boom, you basically explode your DNA. And bad, bad things happen to the cell. And the bacteria start generating an SOS response. Um, with both gyrus and topo isomerase, four can lead to mutagenesis, but ultimately you fragment the genome and it causes cell death. And that's the way the drugs that we're going to talk about work. Now, the drugs we're going to start really talking about are quinolone antibacterials. Quinolones, depending on who you talk to, are, uh, and you can measure how much um, drugs are really used, whether it's by uh, number of prescriptions or number of metric tons or whether it's price. Ultimately, no matter how you cut it, quinolones are one of the most widely used antibacterials in the world. They're broad spectrum. They're very efficacious oral antibacterials. Um, and they're really among, if not the most widespread, among the, among the most widespread antibacterials in the world. If you've heard of any of these, the one you've heard of is, is Cipro or Ciprofloxacin. Um, a somewhat more modern version or, or Levaquin, the reason this one is used more than this today, crosses over to gram positive a bit better, and also it only requires one pill a day, whereas that's two pills a day. The other one is moxifiloxacin, which becomes very important in tuberculosis, and we'll talk about that. What you see down here, this is actually a, an ethidium bromide stain gel. This is a plasma DNA, a small circular DNA, and this is the underwound or negatively supercoiled form that you see right down here. Um, this is a gel that will separate things on the basis of size. So what you can appreciate if something is coiled up because it's super coiled, it'll be sm more compact. This is NIC DNA up here. It's bigger, so it runs more slowly. And this is linear DNA where double-stranded cuts been made. And the point of this is now you're looking at uh, ciprofloxacin, and what you can see is this band in the middle coming up. Um, this is the double strand break and there's some single strand cleavage going on as well. So once again, what these drugs do is they stabilize this cleavage intermediate. So now what you do, bottom line, you take a critical enzyme that works in your DNA and you basically turn it into something that chops up the genome. So these are really insidious and interesting drugs in terms of how they work.
Now, quinolones have been around originally since the 60s. They started really becoming important clinically with the advent of norfloxacin and ciprofloxacin in the 80s, and always really good for a long period of time. The problem that we're having is um, what we're seeing is a lot of resistance coming in. So there are three ways you can get resistance. The first one has to do with the interaction between the bacteria the bacterial enzyme and the drugs. And what you can see here is the double helix. This is actually that cleavage intermediate from a crystal structure. And you see one drug at each of those two cis bonds, the bonds that get cut. Um, <clears throat> there's some residues we'll talk about that you see becoming mutated in the enzyme. And that's, so the target mediated drug resistance is far and away the most important resistance that we're seeing. And for the most part, the most, um, uh, dangerous, as it were, the one that gives you the biggest resistance. Other things can happen. Um, you can have uh, overexpression of, of exporters um, from the bacterial chromosome. And there's now plasmid-mediated resistance. It's coming up in a lot of species. And plasmids carry proteins, or excuse me, genes that will encode for three different kind of proteins. One is what's called a QNR protein, which will bind to gyrase or topoisomerase 4 in the same place DNA does. So it prevents DNA from binding. There are transporters that they'll also encode, and there's an acetylase that they'll also encode that will um, inactivate the drug. We're going to focus today on the target-mediated drug resistance. Now, this, the original model that we're using was actually Bacillus anthracis, which is the cause of aging of anthrax. Anthrax is a really interesting disease. Today we think of it mostly as a bioweapon, but the reality of it is it has really ancient roots. Uh, the most deadly form is a, a respiratory anthrax, um, which really can be pretty much 100% lethal if untreated. But as I said, it's also an ancient disease. Um, uh, Homer mentioned it in the Iliad. Uh, the name anthrax actually was coined by Hippocrates, um, which is, I think, pretty amazing. And it also goes back, this is also the roots of modern microbiology and vaccinations, the famous experiments of, of Coke and Pasteur, where they actually showed that taking sheep and giving them a mild dose of, of anthrax, uh, and if they recovered, they became resistant to it. So this is the really very beginning of immunization. Um, the reason this has come up more recently, at least in the U.S., in 2001, letters were sent to members of government and federal judges uh, that were laced with bacillus anthracis spores. Uh, thousands of people were exposed. Twenty-two people, unfortunately, actually contracted and five died. Uh, once again, unfortunately, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that because thousands were exposed, ciprofloxacin is actually the prophylactic drug of choice. And in the East Coast of the United States that year, there was an extra half a billion to a billion dollars worth of ciprofloxacin that was prescribed as a result of this. So that gives you some idea of just how important these antibacterials are. Now, it's been known for years that there are two residues that you see a mutated in resistant forms of either gyrase or topoisomerase 4. One is a serine residue, and this is in what's the A subunit, um, gyrase and topoisomerase 4 both have two subunits. We're not going to worry about those very much today. But in a specific serine, um, you see um, this is where most, most of the resistance comes. And then there's either an alanine or, or a, excuse me, a, a spartic or glutamic acid, four amino acids away, that you also see um, become mutated. The problem was that no one knew what these were doing. And furthermore, the first crystal structure came out, and that's not this one, this is a bit more advanced, but the first crystal structure came out, and these residues were close, but they weren't close enough to really be interacting with the, um, with the quinoline antibacterials. Part of the problem was the original structure had the orientation of the drug wrong, but it also wasn't quite close enough. There's what's known as a keto acid right here, um, and it's been known for many years that this chelates divalent metal ions. So in the cell, it would probably be magnesium. Um, and there have been many papers published in this, but no one really knew the biological significance of this. One of the structures that came out um, in this paper, which is actually was head spirited by Ben Bax at GlaxoSmithKline, they actually captured this metal ion in the crystal structure. And what they found, and I'll kind of show it up here, it's a little bit easier. What they found is that this um, metal ion had four coordinated water molecules, and two of them were coordinated by this serine and this, and this um, acidic residue. And these are shown here in the sequence uh, for a number of different species. And 
So it was proposed that maybe this had something to do with the interaction of the quinolones to uh, the enzyme. So we set out to look at this. And this was really work that was done by a wonderful student in my laboratory named Katie Aldred. And ultimately, she provided functional evidence for the existence of what we call a water metal ion bridge. She showed that. She also confirmed that these two residues anchored this bridge to the, um, the protein and that this was really the primary conduit for most clinically relevant quinolones um, between the drug and the enzyme. So the interesting thing is you find a lot of different groups decorating it, and they have influence. They have a lot of influence over pharmacokinetics, but ultimately the reason that you have so much leeway to decorate this with a lot of different um, kinds of groups um, is that for the most part, many of them don't really interact with the protein. This turns out to be the vast majority of the important interactions that are going on. So the other thing that was great about this, it shows that resistance and uh, function of the drug are really interwound, so that you can't understand what one without the other. Put another way, by understanding how quinolones interact with the enzyme, you instantly understand how they become resistant. So we did a lot of work with this. Um, ultimately, one thing you see it here, this is ciprofloxacin. The other class of drugs I'm going to talk about, because we're going to use them for part of this, are a group of drugs called quinazoline dions. And this is uh, synthesized for us by a wonderful collaborator named Rob Kearns, who's head of medicinal chemistry at University of Iowa. Quinazoline dions were touted as being very good drugs for a while. They've never made it to market. Um, and it turns out that these could overcome resistance. Um, the reason is these don't chelate a metal ion. But it turns out that it's not the skeleton that seems to work well. It was this group over here. So it turns out you can decorate things. This would be the C7 position, where it's the papyrazine um, and ciprofloxacin, which is what we call an AMP group over here. This actually has direct interactions with uh, the bacterial enzyme so that you don't have to have the interaction over here in order to have the drug to work. This one over here overcomes it. The problem with this interaction over here, and probably one of the reasons why these did not come to market, Katie Aldrin in my laboratory was able to show that not only will this interact with the bacterial enzyme, but it will also interact with the human enzyme, which has a lot of homology to these bacterial enzymes. So the problem was this will cross over into human systems, whereas this one really doesn't. Um, but this will become important because we can use this as a control to look at how these actually interact with the bacterial enzyme. Now, we're going to switch over to this point for the rest of the talk, away from bacillus anthracis to uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis um, is a very, very important pathogen. Um, it's considered today to be the most deadly disease on the planet caused by a single infective agent. Unfortunately, in the last year or two, it just overtook HIV AIDS as being, the, as I said, causing the most deaths from any single bacterial species or any viral or bacterial species. Um, it's got a really pretty nasty course of treatment. It's called the RIPE treatment. Um, it's got rifampicin, iso isocyanide, um, pyrazinamide, and, and butyl. These are not easy drugs to take. You have to take them for six months. Um, a lot of people have toxicities or they can't tolerate these. So even though quinolones are not the first um, choice uh, for treatment of these uh, infections, they're really used a lot because when you start seeing resistance to these or when you start having uh, intolerance, these come up. So they're second-line treatment. And the one that's really used the most is moxifloxacin. Now, it turns out with regard to the topoisomerases, tuberculosis is interesting for a couple more reasons. Um, one reason is that um, very often when patients go in and they have the first signs of tuberculosis, they go to their physician, they have a cough, they have some infiltrate in their chest, um, they're quickly diagnosed as having pneumonia. And so what happens is they get put it on a course of, of quinolone antibacterials. And for the next 10 days or so, they start to feel better, but they relapse. And when they go back in, sometimes they find out that actually the real problem wasn't that they had pneumonia, they actually had tuberculosis. At that point, a relatively large number, as many as 15 to 20 percent of those patients, will actually be now resistant to quinolones um, after treating them that way. So that's a problem. Tuberculosis is really unusual in that it only encodes gyrase. It does not encode topoisomerase 4. So in this species, gyrase is sort of a, either a hybrid enzyme or a dual function enzyme. It's an enzyme that has to work both ahead of the fork and behind the fork. It has to be able to 
remove DNA overwinds as they take place, but also that's people are not untangled. So it's not your straight up normal um, run of the mill gyrates versus run of the mill topoisomeries four. Um, the other thing that makes it very unusual, remember I told you there were two residues that were really important. There was a serine residue, there was an acidic residue four amino acids away. And you see here in bacillus anthracis um, and gyrase, the PARC is, is, is one of the subunits for um, topoisomerase 4. And this just shows you topoisomerase 4 and gyrase uh, in E. coli, and what you see, they all have these. Look at most species that they have that. But here, and turns out in tuberculosis, there's an alanine where this important serine is. And as a result, although quinolones work, they actually don't work as well against tuberculosis, and I'll show you that in a minute, as they do against some other species. All right, so now what we talked about um, is here's that replication fork again. And remember before, we've been gyrase here and topoisomerase 4 here. Now in uh, tuberculosis, it's only gyrase, all gyrase all the time. And so the nice thing about it is you only have one target for the quinolones, um, but nonetheless, we really wanted to be able to look at this. And much of the work that I'm going to talk about for this next portion of the talk came from a paper that was published in PNAS. Uh, in 2016, where Katie Aldridge was the first author. Now, there's a lot going on in some of these slides. I'll do my best to work you through them. The first thing we wanted to do was look at the ability of all these enzymes. So we looked at the wild-type enzyme, one where we took, we'll skip this one for a second, one here um, where that alanine is, has been mutated to a valine and where this um, aspartic acid has been mutated to either a histidine or glycine. These are all three very common resistant mutations um, that you find in patients with tuberculosis if they go resistant to quinolones. This one here is not one that you'll ever see in a patient, but here's where we took the alanine and we put a serine back in to see what would happen if we had both residues that were there that could actually form this water metal ion bridge to see if it would actually make it better. What you're looking at here is an assay that says what's the ability of all of these different enzymes to um, allow gyrates to function properly. Um, so what we're looking at here is what we call a supercoiling assay. We're taking relaxed DNA with no torsional stress, and we're actually putting torsional stress and we're underwinding it. So what you see is this band starts moving down to the position of negatively supercoiled DNA. The point of this is that um, these drugs are unusual in that the more active enzyme that you have in a cell, the more breaks these drugs will create, hence the more lethal they become. So you could very easily become resistant if you had, for example, an enzyme that just didn't work very well. So the first thing you want to do is make sure all these enzymes work well. The black is wild type. What you can actually see is all the resistant mutants actually function as an enzyme as well or even better than, than the wild type enzyme. So that's a really good thing that's important. All right, so like I said, some of these become kind of complicated, so I'm going to try to walk you through it. For all these, just remember the, the black um, is the wild type, and here's, here's your logos again, so that if we now take any of these, the ones here in, in, um, in yellow, in green, or in red are all come from resistant strains, uh, and these carry the residues we talked about before. So let's look at ciprofloxacin. If this is the amount of cleavage that you're inducing, remember, the more cleavage you get with the drug, the more lethal it'll become. This is um, under normal circumstance with a wild type enzyme with ciprofloxacin, which is shown here. Um, when you see with the resistant enzymes, you get much less cleavage. The fun thing about this is if you put the serine back in, we talked about, so that now you have both residues can really anchor this drug more firmly. What you can see is actually it becomes a much better target for the drugs. So unfortunately, we never see that resist, resistant or the anti-resistant mutation coming up in nature, but it'd be great if it could. This is moxifiloxacin, which is the clinically relevant drug that's usually used. Um, and what you see here, once again, you get okay cleavage, maybe even less than ciprofloxacin. You tend to do better with these resistant enzymes than you do with ciprofloxacin. And once again, great cleavage if you put that serine back in. Now, an interesting thing here is um, there are other enzymes, there are other antibacterials in the quinolone family that are actually used against tuberculosis. They all seem to have something in, in the C8 position, so we wanted to look at that. Now, let me go back here. This is that quinazoline dione we talked about before, where this is really the important player, but it also does have, if you notice, something that has a methyl group right here in the C8 position. And as I told you before, since it doesn't rely on this water metal ion bridge, it works great against all these. Um, if you take the same um, 
core here, but now you turn it into a quinolone from a quinazoline diet. So it's that, that three prime, a, uh, that three prime AMP group. Um, now what happens is you have a drug that works pretty well, but now the serine works even better because in other words, everything is working really well here and it's anchoring to the enzyme, but here now you get another attachment to the enzyme. So it works even better than it did before without it. If we go back to these two again, remember I told you that if you look over here, it seems that the quinolones that they use against tuberculosis always have something at the C8 position. So what we did is we took this methyl group off of the C8 position and said, what happens? How important is this for interacting with the enzyme? And it turns out it's actually very important. Um, because if you look here, now if we take this quinazoline dione, that once again, it's not working to this water metal ion bridge up here, but this portion seems to be important. If you compare what went on here, it still looks pretty much the same against all the enzymes, but now it's much less activity. So this position, the C8 position, seems to be very important in terms of somehow doing something with quinolone interactions with the enzyme. If you take the same drug now, take away that methyl group, but now make it a quinolone, so now it can still anchor through the water metal ion bridge, you see something that looks a little different, because now it doesn't have as much activity as it had before, but it still has decent activity against the wild-type enzyme, because once again, it can use this bridge as shown over here. With the serine, it works even better, which is, once again, something that says it's using this bridge, but against the mutant enzymes, which now it has to depend solely on that interaction, it works really, really poorly. So what we can take away from this is really that um, moxifloxacin work maybe a little bit better against the resistant enzymes and ciprofloxacin, um, and that you really like to have something in the C8 position, because that will really help drug interactions. That's going to become really important in a few minutes. All right, now. How do we know this watermelon line bridge actually is functioning? We have a number of different assays that we can look at. One of the ways we act, ask this is if we mutate one of the residues here, um, what happens to the metal ion interactions? Is it affected? And the answer is yes. So for example, if we now take, um, instead of magnesium, manganese. So these are not involved in the action of the enzyme, but the enzyme uses double divalent metal ions when it's actually working on the DNA. And if you now take manganese, what you see is that if you have this water metal ion bridge intact, and it can interact very nicely with manganese, you put the serine back in, it works fantastically well. If you take the wild type enzyme, it still works okay. But now if you mutate it, um, so you take this and you, and you take that alanine and make it a valine, nothing, straight line across, higher baseline levels of cleavage, but no effect of the drug whatsoever. So what that says is that the resistance mutations will somehow restrict the ability of these metal ions to function properly. So that indicates that they're important. The other thing we can do are metal ion titrations, because even though the active site needs uh, mag magnesium in this case, um, it turns out it has a higher affinity. So, you, so you've already saturated the enzyme by the time you're doing things on the enzyme. Uh, excuse me, we're doing things on the drug. So what you see here is now if we take the wild type, and this is a magnesium titration. So how much magnesium do you need to make the drug enhance cleavage? If you now take the serine, so now this should interact more tightly, what you can see is you use somewhat less magnesium to make it function. But now if you take it and you make it a valine, um, now you can see it's much worse. So by looking at that, in other words, by changing the way this coordinates, you definitely change the affinity for the divalent metal ion. If you look at that quinazoline dione, remember that the quinazoline dions don't require this interaction at all, it couldn't care less. Um, whether you have any of these mutants, they work all pretty much the same. So that says that we have a functional bridge. The other thing is, it turns out in some species, the bridge is used for binding like in Bacillus anthracis, all the enzymes we've looked at. It turns out in E. coli it's used slightly differently. It's not affecting drug binding, it's affecting the way it's positioned. So we can look at this by doing a competition assay. What we can do is we can say, all right, we're going to take this quinazoline dione that doesn't need this water metal ion bridge, and we're going to induce cleavage with it. So we're going to need a certain amount of cleavage. Then we're going to back add ciprofloxacin against these two mutant enzymes. So we know ciprofloxacin works really poorly with these, so in itself it's not inducing any cleavage. And we're going to say, can it compete out this quinazoline dione and make it cut less? And the answer is it doesn't do it very well. So that, in other words, the quinazoline dione and ciprofloxacin against the wild-type enzyme pretty much have the same affinity back a couple slides ago. Uh, against this, remember, this cuts really well, this cuts really poorly, and you say, all right, can this titrate out 
the effect of the quinazolam dion. And what you can see, we're going from relative cleavage of one, which is the in cleavage induced with the quinazolam dion, and it's going down to about 75% uh, under conditions where we start with 10 micromolar of the quinazolam dion and going up to 100 micromolar ciprofloxacin. So under a situation where wild type enzyme, these guys both seem to work pretty much the same. Now you have a situation where you, if you had 10 times more of the ciprofloxacin, uh, than the quinazolam dion, it's only knocking it down about 25%. So what this says is that uh, we know this doesn't change its binding or its interaction with, with the um, resistant enzyme. What it really means is this doesn't bind very well. So with, all this goes together and says is, yes, in tuberculosis, even though you only have one residue that's really anchoring the bridge, it turns out that um, it still really is important for the binding of the quinolones to the enzyme. Now, why is it that you can take that residue that we now know was a serine in other species, it's an alanine, so it's not really doing anything, why making a, putting a valine there gives you resistance? We're not entirely sure, probably because valine is a larger amino acid than is alanine, so somehow, um, if we go back, yeah, so somehow putting more bulk up here is making it so this bridge can't fr uh, form properly, is, is our best guess. Um, I'll show you some structures in a few minutes, and we don't really see a difference in structures. So, um, all right, this is a this is a difficult slide, but it's a really important one. So let's go through it. Remember, we talked about before the C8 position seems to be important. So what we did is we took the ciprofloxacin core and the moxifloxacin core, and we did put three different things at this position. We put either a hydrogen, so we put nothing there. We put a methyl group there or a methoxy group there. Methoxy just being oxygen hooked to a methyl group. Uh, ciprofloxacin itself has nothing there, just a the hydrogen. Moxifloxacin itself has a methoxy. So the nomenclature gets a little bit confusing, and I apologize for that. If you look at these, this is the uh, interaction with the wild-type enzyme, the A to V um, mutation that gives you resistance, and then these are two in the, uh, this one is in one of the acidic ones where we're going from um, an aspartic acid to a glycine. Okay. The solid symbols are for ciprofloxacin as derivatives. So the black is ciprofloxacin. The blue is the, with a methyl group here, and the red has a methoxy. Um, we'll just look at those for a moment. What you see here is this is ciprofloxacin against the wild-type enzyme. Um, and ultimately, if you put a, meth a, a methyl group here, it gets better. In a methoxy group, it gets even better against the wild-type enzyme. So it seems to promote interactions. When you look at the resistant enzyme, it has a bigger effect because now with the resistant enzyme, ciprofloxacin works really poorly, but now these other two work reasonably well. So by simply putting something in the C8 position, which we thought was important, it shows you can actually over partially overcome resistance. Same thing happens here with this other mutant. So down here, actually, it's, it's, it's in this line. Here it will be the wild-type um, ciprofloxacin, you put a methyl group on and a methoxy, you overcome a lot of the resistance. It turns out this same trend holds, but it's even better with moxifloxacin. So now moxy, this is the open circle, so the red now, because it has a methoxy group on there, is the parent drug. And then we can either put a hydrogen there, or nothing, or the blue is a um, is a, is a methyl group. What you see here now, so we're looking at the open. So here, here is um, Moxifloxin with a wild type, and if you put a, if you um, basically take, actually this is moxy here, you take away the group, it doesn't get much worse. But now look what happens if you just take that methoxy group and turn it into a methyl group. Now you have something that gives you a lot more cleavage and it's a lot more potent than, than, than the parent. Now let's look at the resistant enzymes, and it's even more dramatic, because now if this is the parent drug, moxifloxin, you take away that group right here, and it looks like it goes really very much worse, which is the same thing we showed earlier. Now you can put the methyl group up here, and once again, it has totally overcome resistance. In fact, if you look at it right here, if this is moxifloxin cutting the wild-type enzyme, um, now, look at it against the methyl moxy, as we call it, against the resistant enzyme. It's doing twice as well against the resistant enzyme as the parent drug that's being prescribed today is against even the wild type enzyme. And the same thing holds with the other, with the other mutation. So that in the absolute really worst case, this still looks against this particular mutation. Um, 
pretty much better than moxifloxacin looks against the wild type enzyme. So basically by just tweaking this group ever so slightly, we can take a drug and now make it so that it's actually working against the resistant enzymes even better than it does the wild type enzyme. So we're really excited because we're getting ready to put these into cells. We haven't done that yet. We're getting ready to put them into cells to actually look and see if this cell holds true. Now, the other thing that becomes important, remember I told you before that the quinazoline dione Maybe one of the reasons it never was developed is because it interacted with the human enzyme. We really wanted to make sure that these did not interact with the human enzyme. This is a toposide, which is a widely prescribed anti-cancer drug. Same thing we're looking at here. The question is how much did the drug induce the enzyme to cut the DNA? This is actually a different quinolone that was developed uh, jointly with Pfizer to really have activity against the human enzyme. And you can see it works great. These are all the drugs we're talking about right here. So what you can see is that despite the fact we've now taken this amoxifloxin, going from a methoxy group to a methyl group, giving something that gives much better activity against the bacterial enzyme, totally overcomes resistance. Um, does it do anything against the human enzyme? And the answer is it does virtually nothing. So it would also potentially be a safe drug. The other thing we did, we can do something called a persistence assay. And basically what we do is we take high concentrations of drug, DNA, and enzyme, mix them together, get a high level of DNA being cut, and then we just dilute it out, almost like a washout assay with cells, and we just see how long it takes this to decay. So this is a, over a three-hour period of time. The only thing I want to point out with this is that it turns out that what we call the methyl moxy, the moxifloxin that now has a um, methyl group instead of the methoxy, it's C8, in all cases decays the slowest. So in all cases, it's the most stable enzyme. Um, so that, that becomes important as well. Now. There's some structural work that's been done. We did some things in, in, in coordination uh, with James Berger's lab, um, which is now at Johns Hopkins. Tim Blower was the postdoc that did the work. And what you see here um, is tuberculosis. This is actually um, moxifloxin binding in the active site, one of these cleavage complexes, um, in, in, with TB um, gyrase. And what you see here is that metal line we talked about, and it goes in really well. This is an overlay of this crystal structure with that that was done by Ben Bax, which was moxifloxacin with which is topo isomerase four from uh, Astinida back to Bamani. That was the original structure I showed you before. And what you can see is there's a tremendous amount of overlap. They pretty much look the same. Um, this is what it looks like from above with with is in tuberculosis. Once again, you can see the drug sitting in, in the active site. This is also now they did structures with the wild type and also when you put the A back to an S. So this is when you put the serine back in. So we know that drugs work much better against this enzyme than they do here, but structurally you really don't see any difference. So the fact that you only have one residue that's really anchoring the bridge here instead of two, which you see here, um, it's still sitting in pretty much the exact same conformation. Um, the other thing you can see here now is the methyl group. So this is what we call methylmoxy over here because it only has the methyl group instead of the methoxy group. Um, and it goes in, it looks pretty much the same. And this is the overlay of, of methoxy, uh, excuse me, of methyl moxifloxin and moxifloxacin. And so one thing that we do not understand is from a structural standpoint, these pretty much all look the same. We were all hoping we find some residue that was interacting, it's not. So we do know that when, when you take the methoxy, go to a methyl, you get a more stable complex form. We know that can overcome resistance. We know that it works much better against the wild type enzyme. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly why that's the case. So for the first part, here are the takeaways, that in tuberculosis, like in other species, this water medline bridge is really important to anchor quinolone antibacterials to um, tuberculosis gyrase. That even though it only has one of the two residues um, that's, that's attaching the bridge, it still works fine. If you do something to disrupt this bridge, either by putting a bulkier group here or taking away the functionality of the group over here, um, you basically get resistance. The C7 and C8 positions are really important because remember, moxifloxacin and ciprofloxacin also have a different C7 group. Um, and so these are also really important. And that by making actually even relatively small changes in them, you can have a drug that really may over, com, overcome resistance totally. So I said we're really excited about the work we've been doing with the, with the uh, methyl moxifloxacin. Um, we've got cells set up ready to go with tuberculosis cells, and we're going to start doing that in the really near future. So we're going to have maybe some more drug discovery, thinking about it more. Um, also with the group, 
um, that's out of GlaxoSmithKline. Um, their disease of the emerging world laboratory in Trace Canto, Spain. We also have the opportunity to go actually go into mouse models with this as well. So we're actually really excited to see where this leads us to see if we really can come up with a quinlone based drug that will completely overcome quinlone resistance in tuberculosis. All right, that's the first part. This is the last part of the talk. Um, there's a totally different approach we can take if we want to even stay focused on, on the same enzyme. And there's a class of drugs that was that originally came out of GlaxoSmithKline. A number of other um, companies are looking at them now. They, they're they're uh, naphtheridone amino uh, papyridine derivatives. They were originally called NBTIs, which stands for novel bacterial topoisomerase inhibitors. Not a real good name that tells you much about the structure, but nonetheless, they're called NBTIs. Um, these are drugs that really there's virtually no mechanistic work on. There's some very pretty crystal structures. This one came out of, once again, Ben Bax at GlaxoSmithKline. What came out of this one is that you only have one of these NBTIs sitting in the active site of an enzyme. Um, the other thing that a few papers have seen is that they will induce cleavage with some species. They'll, they'll induce, they'll stabilize these cleavage intermediates to get more cleavage generated by these uh, type 2 topoisomerases. But it seems to be single stranded breaks. And other than that, literally, there's no mechanistic work at all. Now, it turns out that some companies, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, have some NBTIs in clinical trials. They're actually doing extremely well. Um, the other thing that's interesting about these is even though they're once again hitting the same target, they seem to overcome resistance. Now, at least to quinolones. So now let's look at what, what's going on here. And once again, this is this is from a group um, that's coming out of the uh, disease of the developing world in, in uh, Trace Cantos Laboratory outside of Madrid. It turns out that NBTIs don't work very well against tuberculosis. So they started to play with this to try to select for things that would work better. And so this NBTI is GSK-126. It turns out they have a new class of drugs that are very similar. What you see over here is this portion, the right-hand uh, ring, is, 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 has a lot of differences to it. Um, and they call these MGIs, or Mycobacterium tuberculosis gyrase inhibitors. Now. The only work that's ever been published with these is this group took them and they could show that they had activity against uh, tuberculosis, the actual cultured um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, also worked in mouse models. They have some genetic evidence that says that they're working against gyrase, um, and they could also show that um, it seemed to work against um, cells in which it mutated gyrase that normally give you resistance to quinolones. That being said, there's never been any mechanistic work at all published on these, and there's also been no work that directly demonstrates that they work against um, tuberculosis gyres. So we end up in the collaboration with this group, so we decided to be able to look at this. And this is work that's been done in my laboratory by Elizabeth Gibson. So whereas the first work was done by Katie Aldrin and it's been published, this work is not out yet, and hopefully it will be sent off in the very near future. Um, so. Elizabeth looked at these three compounds, and so once again, this is triple zero, uh, 325, and 126. This one remembers the NBTI, which doesn't work as well, um, and these are what we call the MGIs. And this just shows you, um, this is just the DNA control. This is gyrase with DNA, and under condition we're using, we're seeing very little cleavage. Um, although it doesn't show up as well as it should, this is moxifloxacin, and you see some double-stranded double cleavage right here, because this is, once again, the position of linear DNA. This is an e ECOR one-cut standard, and um, some single-stranded cleavage. But what you see here with these is a lot of single-strand cleavage. No double-strand breaks, but the triple zero gives you a lot of single-strand cleavage. Um, the 325 gives you okay amounts, and the 126 gives you the least. If you look over here, these are the compounds by themselves interacting with the DNA uh, without the enzyme because you want to make sure that these don't have some chemical reaction going on, and indeed you see nothing happening there at all. So the first thing we could do is confirm that yes, these work and they make single-stranded breaks. Um, Elizabeth did um, titrations, and what you see is they're pretty potent. They're as potent or more potent than, than quinolone antibacterials, which one, those are the plus ones, about 20 micromolar. These max out of maybe 5 to 10 micromolar. This is the triple zero again, the, the 325, the 126. These are the single stranded breaks that they're producing. These are the double stranded breaks. So basically, they're only making a single stranded breaks. Now, one of the things you really wanted to look at was why are we only getting single stranded breaks? This, this is a real critical point. And it could be that you're getting one drug in, the other drug is really hard to get in. So one thing that Elizabeth did was say, all right, we're gonna do two things. 
we're going to actually we're going to do two things here. We're going to start instead of using 10 micromolar. Let me back up one. This so we get maximum cleavage at about 10 micromolar drug. We use 200 micromolar drugs, so 20 times more drug. And the other thing is, if you look over time course for cleavage, um, you max out cleavage. It takes a few minutes to establish equilibrium, maybe five or six minutes. So she went to an hour. So she added 20 times more drug and went for at least 10 times longer periods of time to see if a second drug molecule can get in. And what you really see, so this is what we had before with 10 micromolar over that period of time. This is 200 micromolar really no effect whatsoever. So in other words, we can add lots more drug, let us sit for a lot longer, and we're not seeing more single-stranded breaks, uh, and we're not seeing any double-stranded breaks at all. And that's really the critical point here, that even though we're now going to much higher concentration, like higher concentration drug, longer period of time, no double-strand breaks coming up whatsoever. Um, the other thing is that this enzyme, for, to get overall catalytic activity, needs ATP. Under normal circumstance, we don't add it to, to our system because then it's doing other things to the DNA. So if you only just want to look at the ability of the enzyme to come and cut the DNA and put it back together again, we don't add it. So we said, all right, we may better add it just to make sure. And it just is a nice control that this shows you. This in the normal circumstances, black with no ATP. If we add ATP, so now the enzyme is busy super coiling in the DNA while it's, while it's busy working on it. Um, we're seeing single-stranded breaks look about the same and no double-stranded breaks at all. So that's also an important control, I think. Um, it's not showing up really well here, but once again, we can take linear DNA, we can have an, uh, an end labeled um, with um, uh, radioactivity, and we can map sites of cleavage. And what you can see is that uh, we see several sites of cleavage with moxifiloxacin, um, and with these MGIs, we can also see sites of cleavage. And to be honest, some are the same and some differ. So we're looking at that a little bit more as well. Um, all the clinically relevant anti-cancer drugs with the human enzyme and the antibacterial drugs with either gyrase or topoisomerase 4 work because, once again, they slip into this cleavage complex and they prevent the DNA from being closed. Basically, the drug interacts with the protein. It also slips into where the DNA has been cut. I think of them as what I call molecular door stops. Think of it as a door being open. You slide your foot in there. You can't shut the door. And so that's what you have. So if we look at a, a ligation assay, we can induce the enzyme to ligate the DNA, and this is the wild type, which you can see it comes down pretty rapidly. Um, Double-stranded breaks, they're stabilized by moxifiloxin, are shown in blue, and if you look at single-strand breaks, they're stabilized by the GSK000. It also inhibits ligation. In fact, it looks pretty much just like moxifiloxin does. So once again, these drugs work by inhibiting the enzyme's ability to put DNA back together again. Um, okay, we want to see if they overcome resistance, because prediction they should. And so what you see here, once again, single strand of breaks, no double strand of breaks, but um, here in the black is, is the, against the wild type enzyme. And then these are three of the same enzymes we used for the last portion. This is that alanine that's mutated and two mutations at the aspartic acid. And what you can see in all three, in all three cases, there's no inhibition of activity whatsoever. So these entirely overcome resistance. This is just as a control. We'll show you that um, now this is once again GSA, uh, GSK000, single strand of breaks against now the uh, A90V mutation. These are the double strand of breaks, nothing happening. But this is against, and, and this hands moxifiloxacin against this enzyme, and it's really showing you virtually nothing. So under conditions where moxifiloxacin will work really poorly, the MGIs work really well. So that, that, that has really good promise. Um, another thing we wanted to look at is, uh, remember I told you that the NBTIs work pretty poorly against tuberculosis. We said, what about one that's been selected for working against tuberculosis? So with this triple zero again, and most of the things I'm showing with triple zero, actually all of them, I'm showing you with triple zero, um, just as an example, we've done it with the other uh, we've done it with 325 and actually 126 as well, and we essentially get the exact same results. So what you see here is this is its ability to induce cleavage, single-stranded breaks now, with tuberculosis gyrase. And now if we look at bacillus anthracis topoisomerase 4 or uh, bacillus anthracis gyrase or E. coli topoisomerase 4 as examples, um, it's really doing very little. And we have other enzymes we've looked at as well. And for the most part, these seem to work very well against um, tuberculosis. Now, 
one of the things about quinolone antibacterials, for example, is a broad spectrum, and that becomes really important. Um, but if you keep in mind the fact that tuberculosis, something like a, a third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. So if the only thing in the world that these drugs might have a chance of curing is tuberculosis, probably that's a pretty good deal. Um, the other thing is, okay, is it still interacting? Can it compete out moxifloxacin? And that's what this data shows you. So that now what we do, we'll start the experiment this way. We take um, GSK000, we add it to gyrase. So now you get very, so this is basically baseline levels of um, single stranded breaks, I mean double stranded breaks, a lot of single stranded breaks. We now, so we did that because we know we've saturated the system. We can now add moxifloxin, which will give us some single stranded breaks, but will give us more double stranded breaks. Remember in the previous things I showed you that at about 20 micromolar, um, moxifloxin will give you about 30% of the DNA will be cut in double stranded breaks. So if we were to look at this by itself with the gyrase, um, without GSK triple zero in there, this would, the, the moxifloxin cleavage curve would look something like this. It would be up here, and by about here or so, it'd be, it'd be a lot more cleavage. And what you see is that moxifloxin, yes, can compete the GSK triple zero. Double stranded breaks go up. Single stranded breaks induced by, um, the MGIs go down. But once again, here, we're starting with, um, 10 or to me 20 micromolar GSK triple zero to make sure it's saturated. We're getting 10 times more of the moxifloxacin, which you can see you're about halfway as much as it would have been with 20 micromolar before. So ultimately it will compete, it doesn't compete very well. So what this means to us is that the MGIs bind to the same place on the enzyme, more or less, as do the quinolones, but they bind much tighter and they also don't have to have that water metal line bridge to work. The other thing that I found really fascinating was the fact that now what we can do is we can start off, we can take, um, instead of using magnesium as a divalent metal ion, we can use calcium. Calcium, the enzyme likes just fine. The only thing is it gives you more base, higher levels of baseline cleavage so that we can look at things a little bit differently. So we're starting up now with something like 10% of the DNA or so is now double strand cleavage in the absence of uh, the MGI. And so what we can do is we can now add the MGI. And with calcium, what you see, it works really well. We're actually cutting, getting single strand breaks in almost 100% of our DNA. Loves it. Um, but we're focusing now on the double stranded DNA because the question we had is, all right, if you're going in there and you're inducing single strand breaks, is it, um, fine? In other words, you have cleavage on one strand, you have cleavage in the other strand. And it's inducing cleavage in one of the strands, but it's not really messing with the one on the other strand. Or is it really somehow taking over the system? And the answer is it's taking over the system. Because what this shows right here is when single strand breaks are going up, double stranded breaks are actually dropping. So what it means is that this drug not only will induce the enzyme to make single strand of breaks, but it'll actually suppress the other strand from being cut. So that's a really fascinating mechanistic point from us. It may not have anything to do with um, these being used clinically, but it's a fascinating mechanistic point for us so that what we really think is going on is there, when one molecule goes in, it, it allows the enzyme to cut one of the two strands. Once it's cut that one strand, um, it really is going in and stabilizing it and somehow changing the active state of the enzyme so it can't cut anything else. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, we have questions. One of the questions is, when it cuts the double helix, we know it's making a single strand of break. Is it always making it only one of the two strands, or just randomly? It doesn't care which of the two strands it cuts, but once it's cut one of the two strands, um, it can't um, it can't cut the other one. So we're looking at that now. So really, the last thing I wanted to show you is this: that once again, if something's cutting the human en or inducing the human enzyme to work, it's going to be a bad antibacterial for obvious reasons. So this is now showing the MGIs working against human topoisomerase 2 alpha. Uh, this is a big target for anti-cancer drugs. And what you see here, this is a toposide inducing cleavage. A toposide induces a lot of double stranded breaks induces single strand breaks at all, also, but the really important take home message here is none of these MGIs are inducing cleavage at all with the human enzyme. So they have really interesting potential. And as I said, some of these NBTIs, which is the parent group of this, are actually in clinical trials now and they're doing exceptionally well. So, um, Bottom line is that we really think we're starting to understand how the MGIs and hopefully the NBTIs work. 
Um, we really want to characterize further the sites where they cut and the strand specificity. We think that'll be really important. Uh, we're doing some structural studies with these now to see how they look against the tuberculosis enzyme. And we really want to look at some comparison to see if they look the same as the NBTIs against the enzyme. And with that, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, there are a lot of people to acknowledge. This is my lab group in various iterations. This is Katie Aldridge right here, um, who graduated uh, a couple of years back. Uh, she's now got her own faculty position at University of Evansville. This is Elizabeth Gibson right here. I should point out that Rachel Ashley did some preliminary work and some uh, other things that uh, touch on this. Um, she just graduated as well. Some of you may know that we had a, just had a total eclipse of the sun um, in Nashville. So these are some of my students now, and that was what the sun looked like. Um, also, we have some really important collaborators from this project. Um, James Berger and Tim Blower, who are now at Johns Hopkins, really contributed tremendously. Um, Trace Cantos Laboratory really helped us tremendously, and then also Rob Currents. So with that, I really appreciate you listening to me today and, and taking the time. Um, it, it's just a reminder, if you have any questions, submit them, and I'll do my best to answer all of you by email. So once again, thank you for listening. I appreciate you taking time, and have fun at the rest of the conference, and best of luck. Thank you very much.